Uh, first of all, just good afternoon. I uh, hope everyone uh, enjoyed a little bit of sun today and welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, there's my alarm there. Uh, for those of you who may or may not have checked on the Vermont Health uh, Department site, you're now able to look at the number of positives by, by town. It would indicate Johnson doesn't have any, but they will not list if you have less than six. So if you got six or more, it indicates how many are in your community. If it's less than six, it doesn't indicate. Uh, so whatever number we do have, we may have zero to five, but uh, at least there's very minimal amount of COVID-19 positives in Johnson. As uh, if any of you watched the governor's news conference today, uh, definitely the, the curve is flattening and they're really starting to open up the spigot. They've increased uh, to where they can have 10 employees now working in areas and uh, a few other modifications. I'm sure some of those guidelines will be coming out very shortly. The May 10th property tax, the select board decided that we would, uh, for those that have troubles because of COVID-19, making their final payment. That's when all of the interests and penalties kick in. Uh, we're gonna have a form available that they can fill out and it still has to go through the abatement process, but uh, it would be an uh, acceptable way of uh, having those penalties and uh, fines reduced. So that is one thing we're doing, although there is a Senate bill in right now and if Senator Westman happens to be on tonight, maybe he'll talk to it, that would allow the legislative body to be able to change the tax due date or and or the fines and penalties. So that would be an easier way if uh, they get that passed by the Senate and the House. With that, uh, that's the few announcements that I have. I'll turn it over to Gordy for any village announcements. Thank you, Eric. We just barely finished 15 minutes ago a, a special trustee meeting. It was for finalizing our village warning. And we've got that pretty well set. We'll be signing it tomorrow morning to officially authorize it for Rosemary. Um, just a brief few notes. Uh, there's going to be a brief newsletter going out in a water bills being sent out next week explaining some of this. It will illustrate the cancellation of our obviously our April annual meeting and being transferred to June 2nd by Australian ballot. There will not be a meeting per se upstairs like we've always had for X number of years. It'll be by Australian ballot. There will be a, by state man, mandate statute, we will have a pre-vote informational meeting by Zoom or telephone, such as we're doing this afternoon. That will be held on May 26th at 6 p.m. And there you can ask any of the questions you want on any of the village business or on the village warning, on any of the things that the trustees or Meredith or any of us will try to answer. And so this is a whole new era we're going into. And unlike the town where their, their calendar year is, or their budget year is July 1st, the village is because of the public service board, because of our electric, ours is January 1st. So we've already gone in, what, oh, uh, four months into our budget year and we still don't have our annual meeting. So we want to get this through, but we've, the virus has messed us up. So I think that's pretty much it, Eric, for, uh, from the village side for now. Okay. Thank you, Gordy. Uh, the only other thing I want to announce is the Memorial Day parade has been canceled. Uh, that was action by the, the Legion National Board. <laughs> They're canceling all Memorial Day parades. So that would not be, uh, be happening on Memorial Day. They just didn't feel they'd be able to maintain the, the social distancing. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Howard Romero so he can talk about Tuesday Night Live. Um, we are unable to, uh, to do our usual Tuesday Night Live this year, we think because of the, um, because of the, uh, the coronavirus, of course. Um, we think that we can probably produce some shows later in the summer if, uh, you know, on short notice, if 
um, if uh, the guidelines allow. But at this point, we just don't see that there's any possibility that we're gonna, man we're gonna manage to get um, uh, things going uh, on the, the, around the first week of, Ju of July. Um, it just doesn't seem possible. Uh, although we're open to argument if somebody wants to come along and say, well, yeah, here's how you can do it. But the fact of the matter is, if we're going to try and fit 800 people on a quarter acre field, six feet between them all is kind of unlikely. <laughs> so um, with that in mind, um, we'll just see what happens. Please stay tuned uh, through the summer. We will be in touch by way of um, public proclamation, I guess, as to whether or not we think we can pull together a show or two. Um, we are absolutely want to do this. It may have to wait till fall. It may have to wait till 21. I don't know. There you are. Thank you, Howard. I know that's a huge disappointment to the whole community and, and beyond, but it is what it is in the current environment. Yep. Uh, while, you guys have the, while you guys have the mic, uh, Casey, you wanted to talk about the skate park? Okay. Okay. Yeah, mainly uh, one, work has started. Some repairs have been done. That's great. Two, but we wanted to really clarify the message about that, that people can bike there because it's there's still confusion out in the community. So anybody that's listening or anybody that's there, we can help spread the word that it, it, the place is open for biking. Um, and a shout out, of course, to the road crew for helping us put up at the barrier uh, and uh, getting it together so quickly. Um, and Vermont Electric Co-op do donated the cable, which was wonderful. And, and then, oh, as always, shout out to the Sheriff's Department, who unfortunately are still having to inform some folks that they can't be skateboarding. But other than that, things are good. Perfect. That's it. Thank you, Casey. Uh, next, I think Jessica was going to talk about some modification to the library and what they're able to do now. Uh, yes. Uh, hello. Um, so we are back to curbside pickup. Um, so uh, I believe it's Tuesdays um, will be adult books and Thursdays will be children's books. Um, however, if you are a parent of children, you can get both of your books on the same day. Um, but basically call the library and request the books. Um, you can either request specific titles or you can have them uh, put together a selection by genre. Um, or you can go on the, the library cohort system, which I'll post the link in a minute, um, and uh, reserve your books online. So we're happy to have that service open again. And everyone is very excited to get a fresh supply of books. Um, the drop-off point will be at the bottom of the ramp. Um, and they will also take returns at that time, although they will be quarantined for about a week before they can go back into circulation and be checked off. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe Kyle was going to give an update on the food shelf drive that's happening tomorrow. Oh my gosh, it's tomorrow. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Yes. Yeah, so, um, in support of the, the food shelf and their mission to uh, feed our most vulnerable uh, community members, Johnson Works has organized a downtown food drive. Um, it'll start at the elementary school and um, we've got the fire department involved and the um, sheriff's department and NEMS ambulances and Eric's going to drive his antique car, and we've got some horses for Center for America's First Horse, and we have some mascots, some local mascots. They're going to all procession through the village, um, picking up um, food donations at four different locations throughout the village. So that includes the Legion Field near the community oven, uh, the Village Green, the municipal building and on the corner of Railroad Street and Clark Avenue, um, and then end at the, at the food shelf. So the collection of food's gonna happen between 10 and 1230, and there's gonna be staff volunteers at these, uh, these four different locations. Um, and then the procession or the, the, the actual drive, part of the food drive is gonna start at one o'clock, 
and um, we're encouraging people to watch, but to watch from their vehicles if they don't live in the village and if they do live in the village to stay on your lawns and everybody be masked and follow, you know, social distancing rules and things like that. The, um, it's really important that we all follow the rules to make this successful and safe. And I will link um, our Facebook event in our in the chat here. And um, there was a Front Porch Forum post in the last one that just went out all about it too. So you can find all the details there. But the weather's looking great and we're really hoping for a lot of uh, food donations and um, a lot of support for the food shelf tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, I believe either Roger or some representative from the sheriff's office is online to give us a little uh, update on any home invasion is issues that have been happening in the area. Hey, it's Scott Kirkpatrick. How are you? Scott, not bad. You're on. So I'm not really sure what you're hoping for for info from us, but I was just going to kind of bring you up to speed on, you know, what's gone on in the last week or two. Um, I think the word has kind of spread that uh, Sergeant Watson and Corporal Tatro kind of foiled something that was going on up at Travis Smith's house, and that turned out good. He was arrested. Um, things are actually quieter than normal, which surprises us. We haven't we haven't been dealing with a whole lot. Even the noise complaints are down. Um, still dealing with some drug stuff, but uh, it, it's been pretty quiet the last week or two. Perfect. I will say that uh, I think finally, I know we talked about the skate park earlier, but uh, I think people sort of understand what the rules are now and, and uh, things have been quiet down there as well. Good. Thank you. You're, uh, welcome. you're going to be staying on the line? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, I guess at this point, it brings me great pleasure to introduce our featured speaker tonight. He's the executive director of Memorial Economic Development Corporation. Uh, He'll be here to talk about federal programs available and how to apply. And that's uh, John Mandeville. And welcome, John. Go ahead. I'm happy to be here, and I'm always happy to do anything I can to, to help the business community and the municipalities uh, in the Moyle County. I uh, just want to preface this by saying that since this all came down several weeks ago, um, I have been, had an enormous amount of information thrown my way. To an extent, it's kind of like trying to take a drink from a fire hose in many respects. I've tried my best to, um, uh, cap uh, to capture this information, to interpret it, and to feed it back out to the community through the various social media uh, outlets that we have. I've been posting this stuff on all the front porch forums in Lamoa County because I have access to all of them. Uh, I've been putting them out on our Facebook page and boosting them on, a, on our Facebook page. And of course, we also have our own listserv uh, on Constant Contact. I encourage you and anybody else you know who wants to make sure that they get this information. The best way to do that is to go to our webpage, which is www.lamoyleconomy.org and sign up to get onto our listserv. That way you'll get this information sent to you directly and you're not gonna have to try and remember to look for it on Facebook, for, uh, on Facebook or on Front Porch Forum. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, it doesn't cost anything uh, and you can always unsubscribe from our listserv uh, anytime you like. Um, having said all that, there are two major programs through the federal government that have been in play the last several weeks. One is called EIDL, E-I-D-L, which stands for Economic Injury Disaster Loan, which also has a grant component, which I'll go over in a second. And there's another program called PPP, which is Paycheck Protection Plan. Uh, this presentation is gonna be a little bit shorter than I probably would have been because the EIDL program at the moment is, um, I won't say it's dead in the water, but it's nothing going on at the new at the moment. If anybody has a, had an idle application in before they ran out of money on the 17th uh, of April, it's still there, but they're not ac accepting any new applications at this time for the idle program. However, if you did have an application in 
as of April 17th, it is in line uh, and they are being processed on a first come first serve basis. That program, uh, although it's supposed to be pretty robust, has not been very effective so far anyway uh, in Vermont. Not very many loans have actually been made. However, the grant part of that program, uh, which uh, was a uh, part of the concept was uh, up to $10,000 and an outright grant could be made. Uh, it was done on the basis of $1,000 per employee. As of the 17th of April, they had made slightly more than 1,700 awards in that grant program, totaling about $7.7 .7 million. If you figure it out, that means that the average grant size was somewhere in the neighborhood of $4,600. So it's better than the kick in the pants, but uh, it's not particularly um, robust, to put it that way. Um, so other than that, until they do something about getting more money into that program beyond what they've already done, and there's no guarantee they're going to do that, although there are certainly a lot of uh, assumptions being made that more money will be allocated to both that and the PPP program from the federal government. We're just going to have to take a wait and see position on that one. The PPP program, is a, as I said, is the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, and that is a program that anybody can, any business can apply for. You do not have to be an LLC or corporation. You can be self-employed. Uh, you can be a gig worker, uh, what have you. Uh, that program, however, has some kickers in it that make it somewhat problematic for many businesses. It is supposed to be able to provide the money necessary for you to bring your employees back on the payroll over an eight week period of time. However, that eight weeks starts the day that the, that the loan is funded and the loan is required to be funded within 10 days of its approval by the SBA. Um, so as you figure it out, if you apply for the loan now, let's say you're a restaurant, for example, uh, you apply for the loan, a few days from now it's okay. You have to take the money now, 10 days after it's approved. Even though you may not be able to bring your employees back on payroll uh, until after July 1st, uh, but you only have eight weeks from when the loan is funded for the money to be used. So what the danger in that program is whatever you may have taken with the assumption that it was going to be uh, trans, uh, translated into an outright grant, um, you may end up owing a fair amount of money uh, that's not going to be turned into a grant because you didn't use it over that eight week period of time. And in that case, the money that's left there that is going to be a loan has to be paid back within two years. You do get an initial six month um, forbearance on interest and payments of any kind. Uh, but it does, once the payments start, you got to pay it back within two years. So yeah, it's a great, it's a good program for those businesses that are able to make use of it, but you have to be pretty careful. That particular program, the PPP program, uh, you apply through your own bank or any, through a bank that is an SBA certified lender or a credit union or any other lender uh, that's around, uh, but it's done right at the bank. Uh, you do not do that directly to the SBA, which is how the EIDL program is set up. Um, so that's what's out there right now. They did just refund uh, both programs, uh, which went into effect on Monday of this week. Who knows how long that money is going to last, uh, which is why I said uh, a little bit earlier that there is an assumption being made that there's going to be a third round of funding uh, for these programs, and we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. So with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Anybody want to have any questions about any of that? Okay, at this point, thank you, John. We'll open it up for anyone who has any questions of John or any of the uh, previous presenters as well. Go ahead. Either I put it to sleep or I'm not sure what. No, Eric, I have a question. Go it's, ahead, I'm not, it's not of John, I'm sorry, but thank you for being here, John. Well, you're um, most welcome. 
Howard, if anybody from TNL is interested in playing, have them contact me because we can turn this Zoom into our TNL. Uh, okay. Thank you. Well, we'll, we'll see, what we, see what we've got. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. Yeah. Eric, I have a question of John, if no one else does. Go ahead. Um, you know, the big news uh, in, in the area is, of course, the, uh, the drama around Northern Vermont University. Um, and as people try to imagine the future, uh, a vital future for NVU in, in Royal County in Johnson, um, sometimes things come up like either incubator spaces or um, maker spaces or, or ways that business can partner with with NVU to uh, to the benefit of both. And I'm wondering if your organization does has done any work with NVU or if you partner with them at all or would potentially want to in the future. Well, Elaine Collins is on the LADC board of directors, uh, as is Jim Black. Uh, I'm also adjunct faculty uh, at NVU. So we've got a lot of tentacles uh, in there. Uh, we have never actually done something on a formalized basis in terms of partnering uh, with NVU, but certainly it would be something that we would be um, you know, delighted to consider if something appropriate right were on the table that we were able to actually effectively participate in. I'm a huge um, backer and fan of not just the in, two NVU campuses, but uh, VTC as well, uh, and was as devastated and flabbergasted as anybody else, but uh, VTC as well. The attempt was made uh, to close them down. So we're, we're here to do what we can in any, in any way we can. Thank Hi, you. John. This is Kim Dunkley. Back to the Small Business Grants um, question about when, once you've done the paperwork and um, you've got a certification number and nothing's happened because it sounds like all the big businesses got the money that were for small businesses, is there any kind of follow-up that we can do or should do? Talking about for the IDLE program? Nope. It was for the very first small business um, grants that went in. Well, for the, well, that, yeah, well, that's the IDLE program. That's what I'm... That's it was what, with, with, with no employees. So yeah, the, the idle grant was for employees. But you're opinion. talking about for an outright grant. So that, that was the Economic Injury Disaster Grant Program, which was a part of the EIDL program. If, the, if you put the application in before April 1st, you would have to go back because when they changed the application as of April 1st and toward the end of the application, there was a box you had to tick that said you were also applying for the grant. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Eric, can I hop in for a moment? If, if yeah, you're go there. ahead, Matt. So, uh, so John, um, um, you know, at the beginning of this crisis, um, we had a, um, uh, you know, we kind of had made the declaration in the state that um, uh, if you left your job because you were worried about COVID related diseases um, that you could collect unemployment. Um, and so the last night or today, Department of Labor has said, if you are called back, you are no longer eligible for unemployment insurance. I've been asking around um, state officials, haven't had, a haven't had an answer yet, wondering if you've gotten an answer yet, and I haven't, um, whether or not if someone has a uh, compromised immune system or uh, say has asthma or uh, has COPD, that they'd still be eligible for unemployment. Um, I have, the, the communications that I've received has been, if you're called back and you are able to work yet refuse to work, you're no longer eligible for unemployment, um, which I think is incredibly short-sighted uh, considering somebody who may have a compromised immune system um, is called back to work. I think that's, uh, you know, not, uh, correct. I, I, you know, so I'm wondering if you have, through your uh, communications, have heard anything different. Yes, I have. Uh, there, I, in fact, I posted on Facebook today, I posted on Front Port Forum today, and I sent out uh, on our list serve today, the new guidelines that just came out today from the Department of Labor on exactly this topic. And what it basically says is 
yes, if you are called back to work, you have to go, except if you are concerned uh, about going back because you work in a particular environment that is especially dangerous, uh, because you have to stay home because you're still taking care of somebody that is sick, you have to stay home because your kids have no daycare because of, of COVID. There are lots of exceptions that are in there. But they're all listed in, the, in what I sent out today. Uh, John, this is Scott Meyer. I wonder if I could ask you a quick question about seasonal employment. There's a lot of us that have lost our part-time jobs. And for some people, numerous part-time jobs makes your year-long salary. Um, especially based in recreation, which has been more or less shut down. And there's lots and lots of the federal programs, not lots, but quite a few that back employees and businesses. But there's a fair amount of Vermonters as well as this household that have lost numerous part-time jobs. So there's an economic hit to the overall budget. Is there anything in store for this group of people, which is sort of underrepresented right now in Vermont, and we're out there. I mean, there's a lot of us. Two, two things. Um, you can apply for partial unemployment. You may still have one or two of those three part-time jobs. The third one went away. You can apply for partial unemployment benefits. Uh, so that's one thing you can definitely do. Uh, if somebody is a self-employed person, um, a uh, gig worker, contract worker, whatever, uh, they are all uh, uh, eligible now for the expanded unemployment program. They finally got this thing set up online in a better way than it was before. Uh, they're still not perfect in terms of the application process and getting the award, uh, but it is much more, it's working better than it was. The good part about that particular program as is uh, any of this unemployment stuff people have been having problems with, is, is retroactive to the point where you actually stopped working. So it, it doesn't start today when you apply. If you've been out of work for six weeks, it'll go back six weeks. I have a question for, which I actually think is for Eric and for John. It's really for um, all of our government and economic development, and it's around, NVU as well. Um, I've seen on social media that uh, Randolph actually put together a letter to the VSC board around what the economic impacts were um, if VTC Randolph were to shut down, uh, how, that, how it'll affect the town, how it'll affect a number of the operational items that they partner with um, VTC on, um, and that type of um, impact letter essentially. Uh, and looking for VT, the VSC board to work with the town rather than, you know, tell them, talk at them. So I'm wondering if there are, has been any discussion in Johnson or in Lamoille County as part of um, development in Lamoille County, economic development, um, around writing letters and having a united front in terms of um, supporting uh, VSC and how our communities can help um, so just your thoughts on that or suggestions? Well, I can tell you that the LADC board, you know, I have obviously talked about this a lot. One of the other, one of the ex officio members of the LADC board is Tasha Wallace with the planning commission for the, for Lamar County. Um, we are working on putting together some kind of a joint letter of support we were going to do it separately before they actually announced it wasn't going to happen. When it was still imminent that it was going to happen, we were actually working on putting together separate letters. But obviously that became a moot point, so those letters never happened. But that doesn't mean that we still all shouldn't be supplying any way we can, all the support we can in a public manner so that it can be seen by all. What I would suggest to everyone is the best way to get people who are in political positions to respond is for everybody to contact them directly, not just as a group, but as individuals. And that means not just our local legislators, but who are all obviously uh, as supportive as any of us, 
that all the legislators, uh, the governor, anybody you can think of that you can contact, either in writing, email, what have you, uh, and express your outrage that it was even being considered. And as you said, what kind of an economic impact this would have had on Lamoille County, on the Northeast Kingdom, uh, on Randolph. The last numbers I read, and these were, were very, these were not accurate numbers, but the last estimate that I saw was that the economic impact on the Northeast Kingdom alone uh, would have been well over $150 million if they had closed down um, the campus uh, in Lindenville. The, one of the things that I personally questioned strenuously, one of the figures they came out with when they were thinking about doing this was that there were going to be 500 jobs lost. Baloney. There may have been 500 jobs lost possibly within the universities themselves, but that doesn't tell you how many jobs is going to be lost within the community. What about all those workers for Sodexo who, hand, who provide food service on a contract basis at all three, three campuses? I mean, it, if you really start to think about this and what the overall impact would have been, uh, it's wheels within wheels within wheels. And, and Beth, as far as the, uh, what the town has done, I wouldn't say we've had any organized writing, letter writing uh, campaign going on, but a lot of us have individually reached out. In the very beginning, we were under, uh, you know, putting out brush fire uh, mentality. We were each contacting any uh, college trustees that we personally knew and then following on now is contacting our legislators and i've certainly been in contact with all three of ours the recommendation that that i heard was if you have friends in other parts of the state they should be writing to their or contacting their legislators because a legislator will listen to someone who's one of their constituents a lot sooner than they would you know a, a legislator from Brattleboro is not necessarily going to listen to uh, somebody from up here in johnson but if you have friends down in Brattleboro, have them contact their legislator. Uh, in order to keep the momentum going from the state, you need to have the legislature supportive. And I think they are right now, but there's also uh, short memories for legislators who follow the votes and the voters' memories is very short. So we need to keep this on the front burner until this yeah. is resolved. We definitely need full attack on all, all fronts. And I know that I've been very vocal in as many different ways I can, um, including the board and uh, legislature and governor and, you know, and, and, and the list goes on and on. But to John's point, I think volume matters and the um, getting inundated with emails that first weekend mattered, but I think that's probably slowed down significantly. And I think we need to keep it back up because um, all of the little, whispers that I see um, happening or that this is short term and even in the meeting that I joined on Wednesday night, um, it was pretty clear the board had not changed their mind that the plan was the right plan, um, which is extremely concerning just in the words they chose and the manner in which they spoke. Um, so I just want to make sure that, you know, everyone in our town is hearing we're deaf. We are not out of the woods. We are far from out of the woods. Um, so thanks, Eric, and thanks, John. And I, and I think that's probably the biggest message right there, Beth, is we are not out of the woods. And anybody who believes we are, you know, they're just fooling themselves. I agree with you 100%. As far as the economic impact, the Johnson uh, NVU campus is a huge economic driver. It's the engine for our community. The direct numbers, we can get those. You know, what do they do? exactly give the town and village how many employees do they have up there how much money is coming uh, in that sense into the community but the indirect the the employees up there the students the money they spend in our community that's, that's a number i don't have and probably john has a, a closer feel for it with the 100 to 150 million it, it's probably huge that money that's just in our community that would be gone. Eric, can I jump in? Go ahead, Gordy. We just had a trustee meeting and uh, Eric, uh, Meredith is compiling information on a loss of 
water, sewer, and electric. So that's huge in this community. That's utilities for everybody that's just about listening, unless you're on the co-op power line. So I like to, I just texted Meredith, she was been trying to get on. So I'm gonna, I like to yield my time and, and uh, let Meredith explain some of the revenues that we're, we're starting to see losses from the college and it's gonna affect every single one of us. So Meredith, it, it's all yours if you're ready to go. Sure. Um, so when this first happened, uh, we did put together a memo that highlighted the importance of the college to our utilities and the percentage of the revenues for each of our three utilities that are made up by the college. Um, more recently, um, we have been able to look at week over week data comparing um, 2020 to 2019. Um, and with the college being shut down, we've seen about a 15% decrease in our load, um, which the loss of the college, I think, has been offset a little bit by more residential electric use um, with so many people at home. Um, so we know if the college were you know, really shut down and everybody went back to work, the drop would be even greater. Um, I do want to point out, um, I also serve on the Lamo County Planning Commission Board, and at their meeting on Tuesday, they passed a resolution um, in support of uh, the college's um, and bringing the funding up to the level that's needed to be sustainable. Um, it was a resolution that was drafted by Duncan Hastings and Howard Romero and I both, uh, along with Duncan, are on that board and um, spoke in favor of it um, and the board supported it. Um, so that will be going out um, on behalf of the LCPC. So I think, you know, we're trying to compile it. Um, I'll be trying to put together more specific information on the exact impacts to our utilities. Um, going forward um, as projections to just to, to give more data to folks. Just an aside, it's the same situation in Lindenville because they also have a, their, their own utility in Lindenville. I think uh, Lisa Cruz had uh, wanted to ask a question about this topic too. Thank you, Brian. I have been watching, you know, Facebook and different posts and stuff and at first it seemed very clear where we should be sending letters and all that and now i feel like um just sort of confused by all the different email addresses you're seeing and different things is there a single space to go to get the information we need to act on this as individuals <laughs> beth i'm looking at you can i may i, I just say blast it i mean sorry, leah one second blast it everywhere lisa i know it's a lot but blast it. Hi, this is, I'm Leah Hollenberger. I'm with Northern Vermont University. And first of all, I want to say thank you for absolutely everything that you're doing. We greatly, greatly appreciate all the outpouring of support. Um, and, and yes, those, those letters, both from the town as an organization, those are helpful to send to um, the legislators, particularly the legislative leaders um, as well, certainly um, the governor as well. We do, we have been told that um, there will receive funding. Um, uh, one bucket, as Senator Ash told us, was it even last week, I think? Uh, one bucket towards the end of this fiscal year and then later um, towards the end of the summer, uh, some additional funds, but we don't know how much. Um, so it is, um, as you can imagine, it's very critical for NVU right now to receive funding. Um, to ensure we need some type of statement from the legislature that there's a commitment to um, all, of the, all of the state colleges, including NVU, um, to just settle down some of the uncertainty. Um, as you can imagine, our students are very nervous and anxious um, and want to know for sure that there's a school there for them fall. We are prepared, we're eager to welcome students um, this fall, uh, we plan to do face-to-face -face, um, as long as the COVID measures are uh, freed up, but that's our plan to do face-to-face -face, uh, instruction this fall. I do want to let you know that we have been receiving a number of ideas and suggestions on things that we can do to help make NVU sustainable far into the future, and those ideas are great, so please keep them coming, and you can submit them at northernvermont.edu backslash strong. We are in the process of um, opening up nominations for a, a NVU Strong Advisory Committee, and this would be a group of folks that represent um, all of our constituents that will come in and, and look at all of those ideas um, and talk about um, 
how best and to, to come together to put together a model that we can um, take to the Board of Trustees um, for how to address the issues that all of the colleges are facing, issues that MVU is, is, is facing, and to kind of kind of right size the system as what we've heard the legislators say. So that uh, look for that, we're, we're in the final stages of pulling that together. So we are gonna be looking for nominations for that advisory committee. Um, and then just keep those ideas coming. We are absolutely um, aggregating, taking a look at them. Um, and there's still a lot of work to be done. We won that first battle, but the fight's not over. Thank you. Uh, I see Dan Noyes has his uh, hand up. Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, I just wanted to go back to uh, what Eric said uh, about contacting your local legislator. We all have friends all around Vermont. Um, you know, reach out to your friends and say, hey, would you contact your local legislator in Bennington or Pownall and talk about the importance that NVU uh, brings to uh, Northern Vermont and, you know, to keep that discussion going. And um, the, also, I know that the Appropriations Committee is working on a budget adjustment starting, should be out in about two weeks. They should start seeing, um, you know, what a three month budget looks like for the state of Vermont and that's what we'll be voting on. So um, I think you'll start to see some numbers coming out. Uh, I know they've been working on it. I'm not on appropriations committee, but I talk to them um, a lot. So trying to figure out uh, what that's gonna look like, it's probably gonna be out in a, in a couple of weeks. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll have some, uh, some numbers, short term budget, but um, it's gonna, be all that we can do now with the revenue projections that we have. So, thank you. Good. And uh, Casey, you had your hand up also? Yes. Um, for Leah, if she's still there, is there no, a known timeline for when Elaine Collins will make her decision about leaving? As in learning about the new job in Michigan? Um, Elaine is a finalist for a position, yeah. um, and we do not yet have that timeline. Um, it's, 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 so she's a finalist. It's, it's, she's still in here fighting away for NVU. She's still very committed to NVU. She's still very active. Well, I, I know that. With NVU, but there's no, um, she's a finalist, and I'm told that these things take time. Um, so we've got her. Let's, she's committed to NVU. Oh, I know that. I know. Yeah. Okay, thank Is there you. any way we could sabotage it? <laughs> <laughs> Just asking. <laughs> this is where you high five you, Eric. Right? <laughs> <laughs> <The> virtual high five. <laughs> All right. Um, Scott, did you, was your hand still up or did you have a question? Um, if you're if you're asking me, Brian, yes, I guess I put my virtual hand up and I didn't lower it, but okay. I, I got my question over to John. So thanks. Sure. All right, then I think we're done with questions. Uh, unless anybody else has one. Oh, I think Dan has another question. No, nope, I'm just, I got to cut out. I got to go do oh, something okay. else You're right waving now. goodbye. So, no, thanks. No. Goodbye. Everyone have a great weekend. Later. See you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I guess with that, certainly uh, thank you, John, for uh, coming and speaking tonight to us. A lot of valuable information, a little bit over my head, but uh, I'm sure for the business people, it's pretty valuable. Hi, everybody. Thank you for staying on and happy May 1st. So May is National Bike Month. So we're hoping this month we'll see a lot of biking happening around town. Biking is an easy one to practice social distancing because um, you generally don't want to ride real close to another rider anyway. So um, we're excited to be having May National Bike Month. I'm gonna attempt to up my Zoom game here and I'm gonna share my screen, see if it works. All right, so we have johnsonrecreationvt.com is where we go for all our recreation information in town. 
Um, currently, there are no sports happening. They have all been put on hold. So Little League is on hold for the spring. Um, refunds have been issued and we will be working on our fields and doing some of the things we can do in our downtime to improve our facilities. Um, we had several entrants into our April activity challenge and here are the 11 people who won gift cards around town. That was um, done yesterday. In May, we are focusing on May gladness. So I think some of us are starting to suffer from being at home and not being able to do what we love and we don't see sort of the end of the road right now. And so I am hoping we can just focus on the things we can do, ride bikes, visit um, with the people we love via Zoom and Facebook, uh, FaceTime and things like that. Um, soon enough, hopefully we'll visit in person. In the meantime, we'll send our love virtually and through cards. Um, and Saturday, May 9th, the Neighbors Helping na Neighbors will be giving out free bags of food. So if you are struggling to feed your family or you know anyone who is, just go up to the Moyle County Field Days on May 9th between 9 and 10 a.m. Please bring a mask and they will have a system in place for safely distributing a grocery bag of food to you and your family. Um, and as I said, May is bike month, so let's put our helmets on and get out and enjoy all the beauty that Johnson has to offer as the um, trees are blooming and the flowers are blooming and it's really coming alive out there. So it's very special special time out in Johnson. Um, that's about it for us here. Um, we're looking at some different virtual races and things, and those will be updated on our website as we create teams for them. I'm very happy to announce tonight, we have Heather Dunn, who is a friend of mine from Waterville, and she is a bagpiper, and she will be playing tonight's music for us. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and see, let's see how this goes. And welcome Heather for some music to conclude our meeting this evening. Thank you, Heather. Sure. So um, bagpipes are louder than a chainsaw in terms of decibel level. So hopefully this works, but I guess we'll just find out. Uh, uh.
Thank you, Heather. It was perfect on Zoom. Cool. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Eric, back to you. Okay. I guess that ends the program. Unless anything's, anybody's got anything else they wanted to bring up? If not, we'll see you all tomorrow at the uh, Food Shelf Drive. Thanks, Eric. Thank you.